A roar mixed with joy and tears welcomes the light coming out of the Holy Sepulchre. In a few minutes it spreads throughout the Basilica from the candles of the Greek Patriarch. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, also referred to as the Church of the Resurrection, remains a beacon of spiritual devotion and historical reverence in the heart of Jerusalem's old city. It is not a place to visit, but rather a place to pray. Along with belief in the Savior and this sacred place, Christians receive God's revelation through His miracles here. This holy place might shock you because it has happened a miracle before which all knees bend in heaven, on earth, and in hell. When you watch this video, it will be close to the day God died to redeem humanity. With all the love and sacrifice that God has for sinners like us, please repent and join me in offering. Prayer while watching this video. God bless you. But before we explore the mysterious things that happen inside the Holy Church, let's try to answer this question to see what you know about it. What is the significance of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? A. It's the oldest church in Jerusalem. B. It's dedicated to the Apostle Peter. C. It commemorates the Last Supper. D. It marks Jesus' crucifixion and burial. Time to think. And remember to give the answer below, we're going to discuss it together. The answer will be revealed in the following sections. Please wait for it. A Miracle at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre This phenomenon might shock all religious people all over the world. Is this hard evidence of the resurrection? When scientists were recently permitted to open up the place believed to have been the tomb of Christ in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, there are rumors that the scientists immediately smelled a sweet aroma when they opened the tomb, reminiscent of the olfactory manifestations commonly associated with both Marian and saintly apparitions. Those rumors haven't been confirmed, but something similar was reported the last time the tomb was opened in 1809. Not only that, it was alleged that some of the measuring instruments used by scientists were altered by electromagnetic disturbances. As soon as they were placed vertically on the stone in which Christ's body rested, the devices either malfunctioned or ceased to work at all. If reports about the scent make scientists not 100% sure, then they are much less hesitant regarding the electromagnetic disturbances recorded by the scientists' instruments. The phenomena was confirmed by one of the scientists authorized to access the tomb. Later, one of the heads of the building and construction team, Antonia Moropoulou, indicated that it is really hard to imagine that someone would be willing to put in danger his or her reputation just because of a publicity stunt. Moreover, the journalist testifies to the scientists' surprise during the opening of the slab. They hoped that the grave would be much lower than it was. Previously performed analyses with the instruments seemed to have been distorted by an electromagnetic disturbance. God's miracles did not stop there. Every year on Holy Saturday, a miracle takes place in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. The miracle of the Holy Fire has taken place at the same time in the same manner, in the same place, every single year for centuries. No other miracle is known to occur so regularly and so steadily over time. The holy fire originates as a divine light that manifests on the marble slab covering the stone bed upon which Jesus' body was placed for burial. Though there are various experiences by different people at various times in history, it then changes to a fire that that does not behave as normal fire, though it can be transferred from candle to candle, but for a time will not burn damage what it touches. Other phenomena which have been witnessed before the manifestation of the holy fire include lightning-like flashes above the shrine of the tomb of Christ and swiftly moving balls of light. Beginning the afternoon of Holy Friday, Pilgrims wait in anticipation for the miracle, camped as close to the Holy Sepulchre as possible. Beginning at around 11 Trau in the morning, the Christian Arabs chant traditional hymns in a loud voice. 
These chants date back to the Turkish occupation of Jerusalem in the 13th century, a period in which the Christians were not allowed to chant anywhere but in the churches. They chant at the top of their voices accompanied by the sound of drums. The drummers sit on the shoulders of others who dance vigorously around the holy ciborium. But at 1 p.m. the chants fade out, and then there is a tense silence charged with the anticipation of the great demonstration of God's power for all to witness. Shortly thereafter, a delegation from the local authorities elbows its way through the crowd. At the time of the Turkish occupation of Palestine, they were Muslim Turks. Today, they are Israelis. Their function is to represent the Romans at the time of Jesus. The Gospels speak of the Romans that went to seal the tomb of Jesus, so that his disciples would not steal his body and claim he had risen. In the same way, the Israeli authorities on this holy Saturday come and seal the tomb with wax. Before they seal the door, they follow the custom of entering the tomb to check for any hidden source of fire which would make a fraud of the miracle. Might you wonder, how did the miracle occur? Listen to this account of Patriarch Diodorus, who was Patriarch from 1981 to 2000. Normally the miracle happens immediately after I have said the prayers. From the core of the very stone on which Jesus lay, an indefinable light pours forth. It usually has a blue tint, but the color may change and take many different hues. It cannot be described in human terms. The light rises out of the stone as mist may rise out of a lake. It almost looks as if the stone is covered by a moist cloud, but it is light. This light each year behaves differently. Sometimes it covers just the stone, while other times it gives light to the whole sepulcher, so that people who stand outside the tomb and look into it will see it filled with light. The light does not burn. I have never had my beard burnt in all the 16 years I have been patriarch in Jerusalem and have received the holy fire. The light is of a different consistency than normal fire that burns in an oil lamp. At a certain point the light rises and forms a column in which the fire is of a different nature, so that I am able to light my candles from it. When I thus have received the flame on my candles, I go out and give the fire first to the Armenian Patriarch and then to the Coptic. Hereafter I give the flame to all people present in the church. When the Patriarch comes out with the two candles lit and shining brightly in the darkness, a roar of jubilee resounds in the church. The miracle is not confined to what actually happens inside the little tomb, where the Patriarch prays. For the blue light is reported to appear and be active outside the tomb. Every year, many believers claim that this miraculous light ignites candles, which they hold in their hands, of its own initiative. All in the church wait with candles in the hope that they may ignite spontaneously. Often unlit oil lamps catch light by themselves before the eyes of the pilgrims. The blue flame is seen to move in different places in the church. A number of signed testimonies by pilgrims whose candles lit spontaneously attest to the validity of these ignitions. The person who experiences the miracle from close up by having the fire on the candle or seeing the blue light usually leaves Jerusalem changed. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Indeed, we are saved through Christ shed blood, not an idol opening its eyes. The enemy can come as an angel of light. He is a deceiver of the brethren. We are not saved through idols or rituals but believing in our hearts that Jesus died for our sins and washed us clean. Is it really where Jesus Christ was crucified and buried? The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is one of the most important sites in Christianity and is widely believed by tradition to be the place where Jesus Christ died and was resurrected. Essentially, the Church is thought to contain the location of Jesus' crucifixion, known as Calvary, or Golgotha, as well as Jesus' empty tomb, where he was buried following his death but is now empty following his resurrection. These are widely considered the two holiest sites in Christianity. It has remained an important Christian pilgrimage location with the last four stations of the cross on the Via Dolorosa, 
in the old city of Jerusalem. But when it comes to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, many people doubt whether is it really where Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, and resurrected. Is Jesus' tomb really there? Join us in discovering the secrets of this church. Currently, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre itself has a strange and complicated arrangement of control known as a simultaneum, meaning it is controlled by several different Christian denominations at once. This precarious balance is maintained by an understanding of the status quo going back to 1757, and all of it is reflected by the infamous immovable ladder. But just how important is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? First, we are gonna find out when was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre built and who built it? According to traditional accounts, the church itself was built in the 4th century CE. After Roman Emperor Constantine the Great legalized Christianity, he had sent his mother Helena to look for Jesus' tomb in Jerusalem. Supposedly, she found the true cross, the site of Jesus' crucifixion, near a tomb on the location of a pagan temple, dedicated either to Jupiter or Venus. The temple was torn down, with a rock-cut tomb being revealed underneath, which was assumed to be the tomb of Jesus Christ. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre itself was then built over the site and consecrated in 335, originally called Church of the Anastasis, meaning Resurrections. Over the years, the church has been damaged and destroyed several times, such as by earthquakes. The Sassanid Empire, the then incarnation of the Persian Empire, destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in a fire in 614, and it was rebuilt 16 years later. In 1009, the Fatimid Caliphate ordered the Church of the Holy Sepulchre's destruction, though it wasn't meant against the Church specifically, so much as it was a targeted campaign against Jewish and Christian holy sites and houses of worship throughout the region. It was then rebuilt and redecorated later. This continued over the centuries, as did occasional expansions and renovations, the most recent of which was in 2022. Several candidates lay claim to being the tomb of Jesus, some of which aren't even in the region at all. Two of the most well-known alternative possible tombs of Jesus are also in Jerusalem. One of them, the Talpiot tomb, was found in the 1980s in Jerusalem's Talpiot neighborhood. This was supported by the presence of a grave that is seemingly labeled Yeshua bar Yosef, which would translate to Jesus. However, it is widely accepted that this is a coincidence and is likely someone with the same name, since there are signs that the tomb belonged to a wealthy Judean family. Another of these tombs is the Garden Tomb, found in the 19th century in Jerusalem. This tomb is even older than Jesus was, and while it presents some issues with its location and history, it is still accepted by some Christian denominations as being the tomb of Jesus. In particular, the Mormons and some evangelical Protestants, as well as some academics, think that it is the most likely location for Jesus' tomb. But the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is still the most widely accepted location and has been for over 600 years. The tomb itself has some evidence as the correct site, too. The New Testament has said that Jesus was crucified and buried outside the walls of Jerusalem. There are reasons for this, because burials in ancient times were almost always outside the city. At the time Jesus would have lived, the old city of Jerusalem's walls would not have extended as far as they do now, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre would have been outside them. This has been supported by archaeological evidence as well, indicating that the second wall was built around the church later. All the information pouring at you can be confusing, but as St. Matthew taught, be alert to everything. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or, here he is, in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. 
we believe what we choose to believe. Immovable Ladder on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre When you come to the church, you might see a ladder. So, what does a single ladder have to do with it? You know, T. Immovable Ladder of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is a religious symbol of a sort, a kind of miracle possible only through human folly. It is also one of the most powerful and iconic symbols of the divisions and religious disputes within the Christian world. Proposed as the site of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is one of the holiest places in Christianity and has been the site of pilgrimages since the 4th century. However, even this most venerated shrine could not escape the quirks of human nature, vanity, pride, and envy. Even from its earliest days, Christianity was subject to splintering, creating numerous denominations and sects, all claiming to be the only true school of followers of Jesus Christ. The most prominent of these fought bitterly over the centuries for dominance over the holy places in the Holy Land. During the time of Muslim dominance over the area, a government equally hostile to all Christian denominations, no one sect could achieve a clear advantage over the others. As the disputes rolled on, the methods of gaining advantage became ever more W's, including outright bribery, black mail, and the use of force. Today, the situation is an uneasy status quo, a kind of fragile compromise reached in several stages through the mediation of the Ottoman Empire and several European powers. Care over the church is shared by no less than six denominations. The primary custodians are the Greek Orthodox, Armenian Apostolic, and Roman Catholic Church, with lesser duties shared by Coptic, Ethiopian, and Syriac Orthodox churches. The whole edifice is carefully parceled into sections, some being commonly shared while others belonging strictly to a particular sect. A set of complicated rules governs the transit rights of the other groups through each particular section on any given day, especially during the holidays. However, some of the sections of the church still remain hotly disputed to this day. Arguments and violent clashes are not uncommon. In November 2008, the internet was flooded with videos of a fistfight between Armenian and Greek monks in one such dispute. A small section of the roof of the church is disputed between the Copts and Ethiopians. At least one Coptic monk at any given time sits there on a chair placed on a particular spot to express this claim. On a hot summer day, he moved his chair some 20 centimeters more into the shade. This was interpreted as a hostile act and a violation of the status quo. Eleven were hospitalized after a fight resulting from this provocation. This state of affairs makes any agreement about renovations or repairs on the edifice impossible. The church is in a state of decay as a result. The famous immovable ladder is a bizarre outcome of this religious stubbornness pushed to extremes. Sometime in the first half of the 18th century, someone placed a ladder up against the wall of the church. No one is sure who he was, or more importantly, to which sect he belonged. The ladder remains there to this date. No one dares touch it, lest they disturb the status quo and provoke the wrath of others. The exact date when the ladder was placed is not known, but the first evidence of it comes from a 1728 engraving by Elzarius Horn. It hasn't moved since. Who opens the Church of the Holy Sepulchre? Since at least the 12th century, the doors of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre have been controlled by the Nusebe family, the oldest Muslim family in Jerusalem, and the Jude family. Both families continue to hold this authority to this day, having the keys to the church that is thought to house Jesus' tomb. Surely there will be many people here who are curious about whether we can visit this sacred place now or not. The answer is yes, and entrance is free though some parts of the church might be closed for ceremonies depending on the day. Every year, millions of tourists flock here to pray and bring their hearts closer to God. Let's take a quick tour of this holy place. When we come to Jerusalem, the most striking structure on the Temple Mount in the old city of Jerusalem is the Golden Dome, Dome of the Rock. 
The rock is believed in Judaism to be the spot where God created the first human, Adam. It is also believed that it is this site where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is said to have a divine presence, and it is towards which the Jews turn to pray. Not far from these holy shrines, we can spot two blue domes of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the most holy place of Christianity. Christ was crucified and resurrected on this spot, originally located outside the city of Jerusalem. This was known as Mount Calvary or Golgotha. Let's come and see Golgotha. Inside the church entrance, a stairway leads up to Calvary or Golgotha, the site of Jesus' crucifixion and the most extravagantly decorated part of the church. The exit from this site is down another stairway that leads to the ambulatory. Calvary has two chapels. One is Greek Orthodox and the other is Catholic. The Greek Orthodox chapel's altar is over the Rock of Calvary, also the twelfth station of the cross. You can touch the rock through a special hole in the floor beneath the altar. Be ready to wait in line as this is one of the main reasons people visit the church. You can also see the rock through protective glass on both sides of the altar. In between the Catholic and Greek altars, a statue of Mary marks the 13th station of the cross. Inside the church's entrance is the stone of anointing, believed to be where Jesus' body was prepared for burial. The modern mosaic along the wall depicts the anointing of Jesus' body. Lamps with candles and incense hang along an ornate stand over the stone. Then you can see the Aeticule. It is a small chapel housing the Holy Sepulchre. It has two rooms. One holds the angel stone, believed to be a fragment of the stone that sealed Jesus' tomb, and the other is the tomb of Jesus. After the 14th century, a marble plaque over the tomb now protects it from further damage caused by flocks of pilgrims. The Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and Armenian Apostolic all have rightful access to the interior of the tomb, and all three hold Holy Mass there daily. Between May 2016 and March 2017, the Aeticule underwent painstaking restoration and repair after the structure to make the structure safe for visitors again. Right now, they have replaced the marble slab on top, and one can only partially see the crypt through an opening protected with a shielded glass. But the stone is there. In the Holy Sepulchre, in front of this tomb, there is a real absence, an empty tomb where God's miracles are revealed to people. When you come to the church, just be sure to not eat or drink anything, dress modestly, and be respectful. The church is still used for important Christian ceremonies every year, due in no small part to its association with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection.